Welcome to the March meeting of the CSI BIM Practice Group. I'm Roger Graham, one of the leaders of the practice group, and I'm, uh, I'm joined by Beth Strochane, another of the practice group leaders. We'll be getting started with Beth's presentation in just a moment. Here's our, uh, here's our outline for the day. Beth is going to be continuing on the theme that we've had of looking at uh, specification authoring tools and how they work with building information model authoring tools. We had a general presentation on that topic by Beth, if you'll remember, back in our January session. And last month we heard from eSpecs and from one of their customers and how, how the eSpecs platform works with the building information model. Beth's going to talk today based on the tool she uses, uh, Speclink, and how it works with building information models. We did want to note for everyone that both of these tools work uh, with the Revit uh, BIM authoring tool. And we're very interested in hearing about other options that might work with uh, one of the other model authoring tools that are out there. So if anyone in the audience listening in uh, does use a tool that works with uh, Graphisoft or Bentley, uh, we'd like to hear from you so that we could uh, maybe invite you to make a presentation on that topic in the future. Uh, we are going to be uh, continuing with this theme a little further, trying to find uh, other uh, related uh, tools that we can talk about in the next uh, month or two session. Please uh, let us know if you have any thoughts or ideas along those lines. We'd like the, the perspective on the tools and technology as broad as possible so you all can get a full sense of, of what's going on out there. So any thoughts from anyone on that broad range of upcoming topics, please uh, let us know. Well then, uh, let me uh, go ahead and pass the uh, presentation over to Beth so she can uh, take us through the topic on um, BIM and Speclink and share her experiences working with that platform. Thanks, Roger. Um, I'm going to talk today about BSD, Speclink E, and LinkMan. And my take on software is you try to use it as to do exactly what they say that it will do and break it early and break it often. And if they won't, um, because the software vendors can't fix it unless you break it and tell them where it can be improved. Um, a little bit of my background, I'm a specifier with VGF, and I've done large-scale projects in both BSD, Speclink, and eSpecs in the last couple years. And so my view on BIM and software is pick the right one for you, and what that is for your firm is going to vary if you want more information on what the different features are of the different software. Our January meeting is a, a great summary of that to figure out which one works best for your firm and then spin the wheels on it and see if you can break it. And if something breaks, then talk to the vendor you're working with and see how to make it better so that we can move the industry forward. And I, again, I will stop about halfway through and, and get questions. So this is the box. This is the box your software came in. And um, just like anything else, the idea that this software will work coming right out of the box isn't entirely accurate. Yes, it will open. Yes, it will function. But just like you don't use Brevet and all of its components straight out of the box, you edit them. You expand them. You don't use master spec or VSD language straight out of the box then none of the automatic things that they talk about are really going to work unless you use everything straight out of the box. So there is some um, customization to get things the way that you want them. What we're talking about is a tool and how we are using a tool. And it's more of an engine kind of tool and less of a shovel kind of tool. Although both can be powerful, you need to know how it works. And just like I talked earlier about taking stuff out of the box and having to customize it, you wouldn't customize an engine unless you knew exactly how it worked, or you wouldn't know what you were doing would have the effect that you want. So most of the presentations that I've seen are a professional driver on a closed course. This is someone who's used the software a lot to do the six steps that they're going to show you many, many times. 
And the problem with that is you get done watching that and you know you want to buy it, but you don't know how to use it and you don't know how it works really. And so what I want to do in this presentation is go through how does it work fundamentally and do that with really dumbed down graphics so we don't get all distracted by all the cool stuff on the screen. And then switch into a mode of showing how we at ZGF have done that or what we've done with those fundamental um, components to do really cool things. Let's start with what are they saying. Link Manny, welcome to our new world where your specifications automatically integrate with the BIM created in Autodesk Revit. Building Systems Design proudly introduced BSD Link Manny. That is awesome. It works automatically. If you use all Revit components out of the box and you use all BSD spec language out of the box. But that it hasn't happened at any firm that I've worked with. So let's look at how the components work together so we can see how to customize it to work better for you. So here's my presenter bias. Just like Roger said, we are looking for people that have different bias than mine and other presenters that we've had. The only model software I've used is Revit. Specification software I've used are quite a few. Most of them are on the market in the United States have at least tried out. Microsoft Word, ADS Symphony, eSpecs, um, and an early beta version of Alteryx, and they say that it's changed a lot since I've used it, so we're curious to see how it's changed and where it's moving. So here's a quick feature summary. This is one slide out of our January meeting. Does BSD have automatic formatting? Yes. Out of the box language is building system design. It's ease of editing. You can copy paste articles and lines, but it gets a little funky with multiple articles. And um, you can spell check it to the document level, but not as you type. So in reviewing by team, this is something to help with your coordination of your team. How does the team see the specs? With the professional version that you load on your computer, uh, the team must have a full license of the software to see unexplored documents. With the corporate version, where you load it on your server and you have more than five people and a full version of Microsoft SQL, then you can have reviewers that can see the sections without using a license. Or the specifier can export the files to uh, Word files, and then anybody can see them just like any other Word file on your network. So starting with dumbed down graphics, one of the things I always get asked is, so how does language get updated in BSD? It's just like this. You write, you open up your section, you've got a box over here, and that says, guess what? There's something new in this section due to an update. You right click on it, we'll show it, say, this is the old language, this is the new language. Do you want to change it? And so you have that update language in every single section of every single job, not just your master jobs. And you can choose to accept it or reject it at any level. You can also say accept all or reject all on any job also. So, one of the fundamental pieces of BSD is linking text. So just like this, here's three spec sections with part one, two, and three. You can turn on sections or turn on other paragraphs when a section is on. So if you have a precast concrete section and it references sand and sealant joints, in your sealant joint section, you're going to have a paragraph about what are sand and sealant joints and how do you install them. So when precast is on and the reference is made to sand and joints, that, set, that paragraph in that other section can turn on automatically if you link it up. It also works within a section. So if you have three different kinds, kinds of toilet compartments in your toilet compartment section, you have plastic, glass, and metal. You can link through from part one to part two to part three so you turn on your, open up your section, you say, I only have metal on this job. You can turn off glass and plastic, and it will turn off clothes in the section. So those are kind of some things that you can do with linking. And it's not necessarily on, on, off, off. You can say when off, turn on, when. So there's many other things that you can do, but that's how the linking works. The next thing that it can do is reports. So this is a way to take individual lines from all the sections you have turned on in a project and place them in a single file. So this could be all the submittals. This could be all the mock-ups. This could be 
the answers to the 17 questions that the project manager always asks me. What is the answer to those questions this day in this spec for ones that last for specs that go on for two years? That you get to ask the same thing. You can have a project manager report. You simply place a code next to the section or next to the paragraphs that you want to see in that report. Run the report and it pulls them all out and puts them into a word file for you. And that can be for printing text or non-printing text. So. Keynoting. This is how we've done keynoting, and there's new keynoting featuring um, within Speclink or Linkman E that makes this more automated and easier. But this is how we've done it at this point with within Linkman E. So we've got our concrete section, our gyp section, our steel section turned on. When those are on, they turn on the keynotes for concrete, steel, and gyp. When one of those sections turns off, the keynotes for that section turn off. So if we are in SD and we have terracotta cladding, because everybody loves terracotta cladding, we want to install it on every job, but it costs money. So halfway through DD, maybe it gets VE'd out. If we had a terracotta cladding section turned on and with keynotes associated, and those keynotes are placed in the model, and it gets VE'd out, we can turn off that terracotta cladding section. It will turn off the terracotta cladding keynotes, and all references to terracotta cladding in the model will no longer say that. They will have question marks because those keynotes will be gone. And it works similarly with BSD's new keynoting feature within LinkMini. We can also do status reports of hidden text. Where am I at with this spec section on this job? Is it master text still? Have I incorporated all of Stanford's strange requirements? Have we incorporated the requirements for the 2030 challenge for products or other things going on with the project so that you can keep track? So, we started with that. If you can link, you can drive. One of the other issues that we've had that we're solving with um, BSD and using it in kind of a different way is preliminary project descriptions. We get to SD, and at the end of SD, we get an SD budget based on our, uh, our SD project narrative. The problem is project narratives usually don't include things like handrails. They don't include things like, um, usually they hit waterproofing, but not sealant. And so there's all kinds of things that fall through the cracks. And when we don't provide information, then the contractor guesses. The problem with that is when they guess you want painted steel handrails for your hospital instead of tempered glass with a stainless steel top and the cost is not what we want. And so we set up a preliminary project description with one paragraph per section and a basis of cost. So even if it's not the right basis of design, or the basis of design is changing within SD, because it is, um, we'll have enough cost captured in the SD estimate to move forward in the way that we want to. So we set up the preliminary project description, and then we've used that to drive the technical sections. When our concrete paragraph in our preliminary project description is turned on, then our concrete paragraph, our concrete technical section is turned on. It's like, wow, that's not so cool. But what we can do with it because they turn on is kind of the cool part. So putting it together, our PPD turns on our concrete section, which then turns on our keynote report and our other reports that we have done. And we can see what our status is. So at the end of SD, we could have all of our technical sections turned on and be able to run informational reports out of them. And some of the reports that, that BSD has internally are submittal reports, mock-up reports, and some of the reports that we have added are status, where are we at, um, things that we're waiting on, the six questions you always have to ask the team when you know that there are lockers, the, uh, 
whether or not we need two-ply or three-ply roofing. All of those kind of questions that, that have to get asked, we have a report so that when the team starts DD, they can start with armed with information. So then we get into Link Command E. So links, links, links. It all gets tied together through sort of a complicated process. We start with our spec link E language. It's all in paragraphs. Those paragraphs link to products in Link Command E. And I'll go through this in more detail and show you how the, the screens look later. So the products in Link Command E, the products are compiled into assemblies, and then those Link Command E assemblies are linked to components and assemblies within Revit model by name. With um, eSpecs, they link by assembly code. With BSD, they link by name. So then you've got your specification language linked to your model. So logically, that means we could put our model first and use our model to drive our specs instead of our preliminary project description. I would, and there are some projects that work that way. Ones where the model comes first and the specs come second, but that is not, that's not the process that we use at ZGF, mainly because the projects are bigger and longer in our phase, and we want SD estimates and DD requirements long before the model is complete enough to drive all of the specs. Links can happen, but just as a timing issue, the idea that the model completely drives the specs is a challenging thing to, um, to make work. And so we use it more as a review than we do as a driver. So do we see any issues? The problem with linking everything together and not being able to see how you go from language to products to, let, to assemblies to um, Revit components and assemblies when someone is working in a model and they start with a sliding glass door. That could be any number of sliding glass doors. It could be an ICU CCU door. It could be an all glass surface bounded stainless steel patch fitting door. It could be a toilet door that's really low end, and if someone is working on housing, they're going to say, no, that's that door that goes out into, the, um, out into the balcony. So what the definition of that door is varies widely, and it would turn on various different spec sections. Which one is right? The other challenge with this is we graphically stretch and squish things. So we start with a sliding glass door. We get it all linked up. For our shell and core job, we are golden. We get to our next job, and it's a TI that's in the middle of the hospital. So we're going to take the sliding glass door, and we don't have a pharmacy window. But if I squish this um, sliding glass door down, it will graphically look like a pharmacy window. It'll be all great. The problem is, is the links will still be linked to the exterior enclosure, and if you're depending on those links to be accurate, then that's going to cause um, sections that you don't need to turn on and confusion. But there is also value in the ability to see, because within Link Man E, you can see the Revit assemblies and components. So you can see one that says all glass partitions. Hmm, that sounds like something I can work with. Generic nine inch wall. Well, maybe we need to define that more so we know if it's a stud wall or a CMU wall. Between glass blinds, okay, I know what that is. Lantera, I think that's Italian for light fixture. Let's go see if that has a UL rating. And the Chinese graphics, I have no idea what that means. Let's go see what that is in in the model so that we make sure it's something that we can use in the US and has the uh, testing requirements that we need for this project. So the ability to see that is a, is a value even if you're practice isn't ready for linking all the way through. So at this point, I'm going to pause and see if Roger has any questions before we move on to how different things look. Well, we really haven't gotten any questions coming in, um, but I have a question. 
Yes. When when you describe the challenge of uh, you know taking the information from the BIM model into the specs, uh, being one of um, you, when you were ready to do it, that the model wasn't sufficiently detailed. Yes. Uh, is that limitation more, you know, because it's it's hard to uh, connect in the on the spec side to what is available from the model, or is it more a problem that the model is not doesn't really have anything at all you could grab in it? Um, because you let me just, because you described using the um, you know the preliminary project description or the uh, uh, the outline specifications, so I, I didn't know. Um, it has the, are, so. the the challenge has to do with what is in the model. Um, a lot of review and testing of different schemes and theories is done in a in different software called SketchUp or Rhino or all kinds of other softwares and so your entire enclosure may not be in Reddit. Um, and then there are small things like flashing and sheet metal and sealant and all those things that may never be in Revit. And so we're being asked to write pretty close to full, at least draft full specifications partway through DD, and there's going to be things that just don't exist in the model yet due to workflow. If a component exists and it's the right thing, the linking part is easy. It's the consistency of what's in the model, and that's not a function of a good architect or bad architect or model or team. It just has to do with the workflow and how things are developed. Okay, so then I guess you're coming back afterwards and connecting the spec to the model. Like yes, as a so we've done a first pass. We think all of these things are in it based on the drawings we've seen and the conversations that we've had. And then we're going to review the model to figure out, okay, what are we missing? Oh, we have um, two different kinds of lockers and we have um, some weird steel bench outside that we don't know what is. And so it's a way to review and get second and third iteration passes at the specs to find things that are missing or to see things that we talked about early that are now gone. Well, I did find some more questions. One of them is somewhat along this line. Um, do you, you, you mentioned that Reva, or that uh, uh, Speclink connects through the names of uh, specifications and or the names of, uh, uh, I guess, objects in Revit? Yes. Does, and so, Revit uses a version of Uniformat, but do you are you able to attach Uniformat to the spec clauses when you do that? Um, the PPD document that we invented, it's our file that we decided how it would work, is organized in Uniformat. The um, the specification or the components in Revit are organized by families and another word that I'm not bringing to my mind right at this moment, parts and families. And how those parts and families are organized is it's kind of uniformat based out of the box with Revit and then each firm can alter it how they see fit. And so that's where the connection is made. Yes, through the name of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and I think they will you show us a file that has that connection between the object and the mod view and the and the, um, and yes. the specification. Okay, that might answer yes. some questions we've got on that. We also had a question about the Keynote file and if that's a Revit file or a BSD file or. So the Keynote file is a file that we wrote. 
it's uh, and the way that Revit reads Keynote files is it's a text file, and it's really linear about how you have to organize it. And if you open up the one that comes out of the box with Revit, you can see how it has to be organized. It has to be division, and then it has to be um, the name of the division, and then the section number, and that has to be all these different organizational patterns that it has to be in. And we created a BSD file that is organized in that way. So it can replace the file yes. in Revit? Yes. Okay. And, and the, the, the process of how that works is we will export out that file and pull out the, um, like the header and footer information and the numbering and then we save it in an agreed upon location for the team and within Revit you point your Revit model to that file as your keynote file and then that's what the Revit model will see and as we change the keynote file we just replace the old file and it will be seen in Revit as soon as we replace it. Which is how the terracotta cladding disappears works. Got it. New text file doesn't have that. Let me let you keep going. Alrighty. So this is a, a screen from our preliminary project description file. You can see that it's organized by unit format. C is interior. C ten ten is interior or ten is con interior construction. And this is a shot from within BSD. So you can see that you've got check marks for things that are on, which means that they will be printing, and X's for things that are off, which means that they won't be printing. And so this is our driving document. In this project, it happens to be a TI, so I went down to interiors because all of exterior is turned off. And we've got identification of smoke and fire assemblies. We've got fire stopping, joint sealers, and all of our interior stuff that's further down. But we don't have unit masonry, we don't have rough carpentry, so those are turned off. So here is where we've turned those, where that file has made these specs turn on. All the little green boxes over here mean those sections are turned on automatically by something else. That identification of smoke or fire and smoke assemblies in that section made this section turn on and applied fireproofing. So this is something that we've done to alter the fronts of the sections. All of this is non-printing. So that means when I print out my applied fireproofing section, this won't print. But it's guidance in the front of the spec section that I can use to remember or um, if an architect is using the, using the specs and writing their own specifications, it's guidance for how to move forward. So these are our reports where, what's our project status? I've taken out things so this section is complete for patching only. So if we're using this on another project, I can remember, okay, this is patching only. I'm waiting on, I don't have any questions. We can do a thing with coordination, so we can remember what to coordinate. And also sustainable materials, if we have information available, and two things that are starting to hit and we're figuring out how to work with are the 2030 challenge for products and carbon equivalents. How do we keep track of what's baseline? How do we keep track of what we've learned? We've put this language in the front of our specs that isn't um, available and reporting yet because baseline hasn't been set, but we're set to react to that when it happens. The other is product contents, things that are going to be on the red list that we need to watch for in this section. So if we've got um, carpet tile, there'll be something in here that says watch for the red list component vinyl because it is in the backing or is potentially in the backing. So when people are working with this file, they know what to look for. The advantage of that is they can get a report at the beginning of DD with things to watch for when they're selecting materials. So here's a report that's run. So he, this pulls the sustainable design, here we go, the sustainable material information line for all the spec sections within that project and only the ones that are turned on. So you don't have 
all 500 sections that your firm uses, only the 25 that happen to be in this TI. So sustainable materials uh, for architectural wood casework, it um, lead impacts credits relating to rapidly renewable material, certified wood, low emitting material adhesives, and um, composite wood ag fiber. So those things are things to watch for if you're doing a lead project and you're working in this section. Another report that we've done is our waiting on report. And so with this, waiting on resilient flooring. Colors to match existing are discontinued. Select new color. So that we can use this report when we're talking to the client or when we're talking to the project team about what are we still waiting on and what answers do we need for questions. Uncomplete unless the client wants changes. Things like, are we providing any accessories on this project or is the client? This is a small TI at a hospital where they often provide all the, the uh, accessories. This is our keynote file. You can see Division 6. This is what it is. And this is the form that it has to take or um, it will cause Revit to error. And so this is some manual effort to get this to work and or you can do it much easier with uh, the new BSD keynoting feature. So now we've started DD. All of those things that we just talked about are available at the end of SD. And that's the power of what we're trying to do is get organized information in the hands of people on the team so that they can effectively move forward in DD rather than having conversations about terminology, about is this product that I selected and now know and love even legal on this job? We want people to have that information earlier rather than later. So now we're into Linkman and what that looks like. So model contents are reviewed. This is the Revit project tab and Linkman is set up with tabs with different views of things that you're looking at. <clears throat> so this is a look within the Revit model. So we've got doors. The ones that are green are all linked up. The ones that are, um, oh, excuse me, I was wrong. The ones that are green mean they exist in the model. The ones that are green with a check mark means they exist in the model and they're linked to eSpec's language, or not eSpec's language, goodness, VSD spec link language. And the other interesting column is number. So you can get how many double flush doors of that size are in the project. How many of those? Oh, there's eight of these, eight overhead rolling doors. What kind of job is this? Um, so you can see what's in the model. So there is value in this. Even if you don't end up linking through, you can see what's in your model. And you can filter so that you can only see things that actually exist, as opposed to everything that got loaded in the model. Because you, you can load components within your model, but not place them on sheets. And so if they're loaded in the model, you will see them in here. And if they're placed on sheets, they will have a green box and you can sort by that and only see those. Keynotes too. This is the Keynote tab which will show you which ones are in the model and how they read and what you're looking at. And this will help you manage them in a more straightforward manner than the way that we've done it. Um, if managing the text file and all of its idiosyncrasies is not something that you're really excited about doing. So assemblies are built and linked to Revit. Linkman E has assemblies. And the way that I found that works really great is having your tabs split horizontally because the way that you build assemblies or the way that you link assemblies together is you say, OK, here's my Revit thing. And I'm going to link it. I think you hold down control and drag and drop. So I'll have to check in with BSD. I don't remember if it controls the right key. Um, and you link it together. So it's a drag and drop kind of link process. So once you get your assemblies in Linkman, link to your assemblies and components in Revit, you have to put products in your assemblies. And this is like putting products or anything else in a bucket. So your assemblies are your bucket, what products are going in them. If you've got a revolving door, it would be really easy because you're probably only going to have one product in your revolving door assembly. 
for the wrong door. But you're going to have other products like um, like automatic entrances. You may have the actuator in a different place than the door. And so your automatic entrance assembly will have products for actuator and products for door. And you drag them off of the you drag your products into your assemblies. So then your products are linked to your language in BSD, speclink. So this is the section number and ID, and this is the line of that section that the text exists in. And you link these products or this language to these products. So then you've got your Revit model or your Revit components and assemblies linked to your Speclink or assemblies, which then are filled by Speclink products, and the Speclink products are linked to your specification language. And then you could open up the Revit thing again and review for what still has missing links. You can see what in Revit is missing. So like Roger asked the question of what would you use this for? And this is reviewing, do we have walkers in our model that I don't have specified? Do we have toilet accessories? Do we have benches? Do we have um, towel rods and other things that are within the model that I haven't found yet? Another kind of door? Do we have overhead grills? Do we have bifold doors? So all of those things that you're trying to make sure you have everything, this is a way within the Revit tab. I'm sorry, I cut off the tab. This is the Revit tab that you can review what's in Revit. And reviewing for missing links, no, it's not this guy, although I'm very curious about all those links. So you go through that process once, and then you repeat it, and you repeat it, and you repeat it until you're done with the job. And the reason that repeat process keeps happening is because the model keeps evolving. When you get from at the end of SD, your model within Revit might be very conceptual. And then halfway through DD, you run this process again, and you get a lot more content and do a lot more review and add more to the specifications. And then when you get clear through DD, you run another repeat to see what is now in the model that you don't have specified yet, what is in your specs that no longer exists in the model so that you can keep the process going. So coordination happens, everybody talks about things that are missing, and things get added where they needed to be added, and documents are issued. The documents that get issued out of VSD are just like the documents that get issued in Word files. You export it out and they look just like Word files. So it all sounds lovely, but what is missing and, and why it is important? The thing that we find most that's missing is the ability to track changes in the database. Because we're doing large phased projects, and even small projects are now phased into three packages. And if we issue our painting section, because they need paint on the uh, um, handrails on the utility vault for the city, they go out in the foundations package and the utility package. Okay, so when that paint section goes out again for the foundations package or the shell and core package, it has to be track changed for the contractor. At that point, I can't have it in the database yet. So I may have to export out my paint section and not have it in the database as early as 50% DD. And the challenge with that is, is we learn the most about projects, about products, about where we've had problems during that process. And at that point, we're not in the database where we can be correcting our errors on the, in the same software that we're working in. And so that's why I see this being one of the big challenges. Um, the next thing that is that I would love to happen is push user text to ongoing projects just like BSD can do with their updates, the little orange screen at the very beginning, right click, incorporate this change into my job. So I know it's possible, um, but if I'm working on lots of great big projects all at one time, and I learn something about wood siding, 
and I need to make sure and change what my moisture content is and I need to make sure that I say that these faces are not architectural grade because that doesn't exist. Um, they are type C faces and I've got that wrong in this project. Um, I need to update that but I can't push that to my jobs that are ongoing. I'll try to remember all of them that have that and I'll update it in my master but the challenge is, is what about the one that I miss? And so if I could push that and say, okay, all of the, the information from in-house learning is going to be a purple box, then when I was going through those sections at the end of CDs, I could check out the purple boxes to see if they applied to my job, just like I could check out the BSD updates to see if they applied to my job before it goes out the door. So that's something I would love. The other thing is export something that contractors can use. I'm not entirely sure what that is yet. Um, I know that I've been asked for submittal reports that BSD does that is great. Um, I've been asked for mock-up reports and that's great. But as far as being able to export um, a list of products, being able to let export a list of manufacturers or something like that, and I'm making up those examples because I'm not sure what it is, but being able to see different parts of the database and have control over some of the report writing because the version that we're using, the uh, um, corporate version, is a full license of Microsoft SQL which is a database software that lots of big things run on so I know that there's user interfaces to interact with it um, and so being able to have more freedom with that I think would be really good in the future, but I don't have any great suggestions that are really concrete at this point. Now I'm going to ask if there's any questions or if everybody's now ready to drive and see what they can uh, do with the different software. And if you want the uh, professional driver on the closed course version, um, Alex Bear is really great at giving that presentation. And um, he's also really great at saying, pause, can you explain this part to me again? Because I do that all the time. And my goal with this is not that everyone thinks that BSD is great because that's the software that I use. It has to do with figuring out which software works best for the practice that you have, and those are going to vary, making the right choice, and then pushing the software to its limits so that we can make it better. So with that, I'll ask you, is there any more questions that people have? One question is, do you have to have link man to do keynoting, or can you do it just with spec line? The way that we have done keynoting is just with spec link. But you have to be really annual and really linear. Um, but it can be done, and that's how we are doing it. Um, if you want to have software to help you manage the process, the software to help you manage it is in link man. And I think, is it also true that the keynotes in Revit use master format numbers, but, the, but you're generally driving it from, that the families are uniformat, so does the, uh, I mean, I guess Revit assigns those keynote numbers that showed up in there, right? Um, if you use out-of-the-box components, then they have Revit keynote numbers in them, potentially. I mean, nine-inch generic wall doesn't have any keynote in it because it's not anything, really. Um, some of the out-of-the-box components do have keynote numbers in them. And those are um, e-spec, or those are master spec centric. There's a master spec number and a dot and then an alpha numeric delineator. And those are organized by master format. So I'll, I'll pick you with a little extra comment. This is Mark Chavez. The, remember, when you're keynoting in Revit, you're pointing to, usually, you're pointing not the entire assembly, but the individual components. So when you're drawing a detail and you brought up your uh, brick veneer wall assembly, when you touch the brick, it goes to the keynote list and it grabs the keynote for the brick. It's not having a keynote for the assembly. So that's how you can do um, keynote 
assemblies versus keynote um, components. And really, the contents of the keynotes you can completely control. Revit comes out of the box with a keynote file. There's 5,000 keynotes or so in it, and includes the section for fast ripping. Um, none of the firms I've ever worked for or ever saw had a fast rip. So the problem with using the Revit keynote out of the keynote file out of the box is there's millions of things. How can I can't even remember the difference between SVS or APP or the other kind of modified bit roofing. And if you've got that many choices for your team that's doing models to choose from, they're not going to get it right. I mean, I can't even get it right, and I'm really geeky and linear. And so what it allows you to do with doing your own custom keynote file, whether you manage it or BSD manages it or eSpecs manages it, is that you can cut that down so that it's only sections that are in your job. If your job only has 25 sections because it's a TI, then only make them dig through 25 sections. And if there's only one roof section to pick from and they know that that's on their job, I bet they're going to pick the right one. So that's a lot of why we've cut down the keynote file. And within Revit, you can control whether the keynotes show as numbers, the weird spec section dot alpha numeric delineator, or as text. And so on the drawing side, you don't have to see the conduct kind of numbering system at all. It's just a way to manage your terminology without seeing those numbers. All right, I think that covers most of the questions on keynoting. Um, now what about, you showed us how um, you've got the Revit uh, list of objects from the model and you're looking at the specs and seeing where the two line up. Uh, and so that's all coming in one direction, right? From the model to uh, the spec. And I think we've asked this question before, but you don't go back from the spec, you're not communicating back to the model, but you can see what you have in your spec that isn't associated with anything in the model, right? Yes. The only thing, and this is only partial recollection and hearsay, that goes from BSD Linkman to the model is the keynoting. If you're using their keynoting management um, within the model, then it pushes keynotes to the model. But other than that, nothing pushes to the model. It just pulls and reads. Do you see some benefit if that did happen? The challenge with that happening is then you have to choose who owns what. And it's, it's safer Ooh. if the model owns things because the model is driving. Um, but I think that in the future, being able to pull and push and choose what owns the information, I think that the industry will eventually get there. But right now, if the models are driving, let the models drive. And so once one way get, street is safer. Um, yes, divided highway is usually safer. It might not get you where you want to go, but <laughs> it's safer. Well, um, I think we're about out of time here. About one last question that, that's come up in a couple of different ways is around the uniformat and master format differences, and uh, um, if you can use both interchangeably in Speclink and, and connect them to the Revit families, or do you have to use one or the other? Um, most of the Speclink files that I have seen and use are in master format. And we organized our preliminary project description in uniformat because it's an SD. And I think that and BSD out of the box also has, um, they don't call them preliminary project description files, but they have schematic design specs that you can toggle back and forth to. And they're in uniformat. And one of the, we've had lots of conversations about using our own file for SD versus those files for SD. And simply our goal is to have one file open that drives rather than opening 200 little tiny files. And so that's why we chose to go to a single file. 
and we have used text out of the files that they have, and so the information is good. It's just not a format that was conducive to what we were trying to do. A single file being a master format file? Um, no, our, a single file being our preliminary project description file. Oh, okay. And it's organized by uniformat, but okay. has master format paragraphs in it. Got it. Okay. Um, well, I think that is, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, I think we've hit most of the questions that seem to have come in. If there are any other questions that anyone has, they can reach you or me or Rob Holson. So um, with that, I think we've hit our, hit our hour, Beth. I want to thank you very much for this interesting presentation, and we'll keep going on this topic a little more next month. All righty. Thank you, Roger, and have a lovely day, everyone. Thanks, Beth. You too. Bye, all.